Give it up for all of our house churches that are joining us, all of our friends here locally as well as globally, and Jamaica and India and Bahamas. What's up with it? Bahamas and Jamaica. Y'all might need a visit. I'm just saying. Hey guys, thanks for joining us uh, online today. Hey, r- real quick, uh, today is a really special day for two reasons. One, what we're about to talk about, but two, because on the calendar this weekend, uh, remember something that's really important to us and inside the life of the church. This weekend is three years, the three year anniversary since Summer and I stepped in as the senior pastors here at Victory. <laughs> If you rewind back to August 2020, not much was happening. Uh, just a little thing called COVID uh, was going on. Uh, but Pastor Dennis and Colleen are here as they always are on the front row. And so I want to acknowledge them and honor them as the founding pastors of the church who built so faithfully for so long. Yeah. The, the best that Summer and I can say is, like, like Paul says, you know, that, that I, they laid a, a good foundation. Now others are building on top of it. So uh, that's what Summer and I get the privilege to do is to build on the foundation as we all go into the future of where where God is taking us. All right, so hey, uh, one other uh, question I wanna ask is this. How many of y'all were here last week? Okay, a lot of us, a lot of us, a lot of us, okay. So if you were here last week and you came back this week, you are the super spiritual commando Christians in my book because you knew that we were talking about money, and you came back anyway. Um, and I say that because we all know this, that people, people get a little funny whenever we talk about money and God in the same sentence, right? So uh, I don't know about how you grew up, how I grew up, okay? Uh, we, we would uh, consistently, pretty, pretty pretty frequently, go and visit my extended family, my grandparents in Athens. And growing up, my grandmother, they had some money, and so what they did, they had one of those giant satellite dishes in their backyard. Anybody over 40 know what I'm talking about? Right, I say over 40 because there's a teenager somewhere who's like, yeah, duh, like I have a dish satellite on my roof. No, dude, like that's new technology. Um, if, if we had tried to put my grandmother's satellite on your roof, your house would have imploded. Like she had, she had a NASA-sized satellite. It's like she called up 1-800-NASA and they sent her a satellite dish um, for her backyard. And she had that satellite dish for one reason and for one reason only, to get Christian television. Because you couldn't get Christian television on regular TV. And so uh, they, she had, she called 1-800-NASA and they sent her this thing and we could tap into TBN and whatever else was going on in the airwaves at that time. And uh, when I would go to visit, I'm curious, I'm not following Christ. Like I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm just a little skeptical of the whole thing. And so I'm like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reach on the back of the TV. There's a little switch that would turn it from regular TV over to the, you know, the, the moon lander uh, that, that could tap in. And so I turned on Christian television. And invariably, the shot that I would turn on to, there'd be two high back chairs, wing back chairs. There'd be two people sitting there. One of them's crying, always, with purple hair <laughs> or blue hair. And the other one has this posture. <laughs> right? And with a little bit of an accent, it's like, brothers and sisters and the Lord. And there was always promises like, hey, if you send in $100, I'm going to send you some miracle spring water. I don't know where they got it. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it when I get it. Um, But I was going to give me some miracle spring water. And if you send in $500, they're going to send you a cloth that they prayed over. You can put it on your bunions. And I don't know. Um, If you send in $5,000, right, God's God's going to give you a hundredfold. We're going to pray that you get a hundredfold return. If you don't send in $5,000, you don't get that prayer. If you want the hundredfold, you got you, you to give more to get more. You know what I'm saying? And um, if you, fa- I, you know, I was just kind of taking it in. But if you fast forward from then to today, most of those guys are in jail. <laughs> and there's still a handful that are around that are worth a billion dollars, you know, flying their jets everywhere. But if you're new to victory, here's why I need to say that. This is not one of those churches. This is not one of those churches, Okay. Today, you're not going to hear sow your seed to meet your greed. I promise you no hundredfold return on your giving today. Now, here's the deal. God blesses. 
God is a God, God is true to his word. He will keep his word. He will bless those who bless. I do not make you those promises. God keeps his promises. I don't make you any promises today. But I need to tell you this today for, for, for the sake of our hearts and for the sake of our ears over the next few minutes. Today, you're a part of a giving church. Okay, so years ago, at the, really close to the foundation of the church, we made the decision as victory, uh, kind of pledged to the Lord to say, hey, we're gonna give at least 20% of what comes in back out, right, into local and global missions to bless the world so the gospel would go out. And so I love keeping track of this number. And in fact, I actually have a, an up-to-date current number that in the lifetime of victory, we have given away $94.7 million. <laughs> to get the good news of Jesus out into the world. You are a part of a giving church today. But I understand why some of us are really skeptical whenever God and money are mentioned in the same sentence, right? Because there's a lot of water underneath that bridge. But today, we're talking about money because God talks a lot about money, right? In the Bible, because God knows the power of money, God knows there's power in money to build up or to tear down, to enslave or to set free. God, God knows, this, knows that money can be used for good or for evil. Like, that's why God talks a lot about money. And what gets me excited about a day like today is we have the opportunity to change the narrative when it comes to God and money, right? Like, what if God's people were known by their love again? What if God's people were known by their generosity again? All right, I'm gonna, I'm, that's gonna be my uh, presidential platform, like make Christianity generous again. That's what I'm gonna do. Like, what if God's people did money different? Come on, somebody. What if God's people trusted God in radical ways again? What if you were actually able to arrive at the, this place in life where the word money was mentioned and it didn't stress you out? What, what, if, what, if, what if we actually got so liberated in this financial area, that we weren't always living in debt up to our eyeballs and our kids weren't gonna have to pay our credit card bills after we die? What if we actually got free? And I believe that God, as the good shepherd, is taking us to that place. Jesus cares about this because he cares about us and he knows the power of money in our life. And that's why he talks about things like this in the Sermon on the Mount, which is where we landed last week in Matthew 6, verse 19. This is where we're starting kind of these few weeks that we're talking about this. Here's where we landed last week. Matthew 6, verse 19, where he says very famously, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This word treasure is really important. And this is kind of where we landed last week. We said that every single one of us has a, a telos or an end goal or what would be called a treasure. Our treasure isn't just the money in our pockets. No, the treasure is the vision of the good life that lies out ahead of us. The treasure is where our life is going. The treasure is the thing that we kind of subconsciously live and we make decisions for. That's why Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, whatever lies at the end of the rainbow for you out there is where your heart will be also. Whatever your goal is in life, that's where your money will be. That's where your financial conversations are. That's where your family is. That's where your kids are moving. Everything's moving in the direction of what your treasure is, which is why we have to be really intentional about actually painting the right picture of what our treasure is. And if you haven't answered that question yet that we kind of gave that challenge for, you need to actually write down, articulate, what is my treasure? What's my goal? What's my telos? Where am I going? Because here's what Jesus says. There, there's a difference sometimes in what we say and what we do. Because if we say that my treasure is heaven, that's where I'm going. But then we look at our life and all we're doing is storing up here, there's a dissonance, right? So if I'm saying that that's my treasure, then I actually have to ask, am I living to store up here? Am I focused here? Am I hoarding here? Or am I storing up there? Am I giving there? Am I focused to trying Fill there. In fact, we were praying this yesterday morning. We gather together everything, every single Saturday morning, and we pray uh, in the chapel over here at 8 a.m., and we found ourselves praying. We were saying, God, may heaven be more crowded because of how we live and how we give. Come on, somebody. Could you pray that about your life? God, I pray I have more neighbors because of how I live and how I give in this life, that I wouldn't just live to store up treasures here on earth. I live to store up treasures in heaven. 
And as we get those priorities set in our heart, Jesus continues on. And we left off last week in verse 21. This week we're picking up to today in verse 22 of Matthew 6. Here's what Jesus says, red letters. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now here's the deal, I know this. I know human nature and better than that, I know Christian nature. Um, He says something right here that most of us probably just skip whenever reading the Bible. No? You're like, no, I've never done that before in my life. I fully exegete and look at the commentaries in the Greek. No, you know how we do, right? Like we're reading the Bible and we're like, mm, that's good. Mm, that's even better. Mm. No, I don't know that part. Skip. And we just go, like most of it, I guarantee you, we're like eyes, windows, money, next. We're like, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. But I'm here today to tell us, guys, if Jesus said it, it's important. And in fact, really when you know what he's saying, it's really beautiful. All right, so here, here's what was happening, okay? Um, there, was a, there was a common Jewish saying or an idiom of the time. We, we know this, sometimes I have to remind us, Jesus was Jewish, right? Jesus, Jesus was not American. He didn't help to write the Constitution, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, we're, we're in first century Jewish eyes, Jewish understanding, Jewish language. So um, there, was a, there was a first century Jewish saying or an idiom that, w- that went like this, that if you have good eyes, you're generous, If you have bad eyes, you're greedy. If you have good eyes, you're generous. If you have bad eyes, you're greedy. So Proverbs 22, nine, here, here, the New King James grabs the language a little bit more word for word and it says this, he who has a generous eye will be blessed for he gives of his bread to the poor. So the NIV actually says he who's generous, right? Just translates the idea of it, not just the word for word. So if you go over even just another one, Proverbs 28, 22 says this in the New King James, a man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. The NIV translates that as stingy. Here's what it's saying, guys. If you have a good eye, you're generous. If you have a bad eye, you're greedy, you're stingy. So we we know this in the natural, right? That if you have good eyes, you lift up your eyes. The, the world is bright. Man, the sun is shining. You can see for miles. Like there's, there's so much opportunity. There's so much out here happening, so much going on. If you have bad eyes, your life starts to shut down. Your life starts to get close to you. How many of y'all have like really bad eyesight? Like if you took your glasses off, you see like a foot in front of your face right? That's what Jesus is saying here. He's taking that idea and he's bringing it into the spirit. And here's what he's saying. If you have good, generous eyes, your whole life will light up. If you have bad, greedy eyes, your whole life will shut down. Your whole life gets dark. Your whole life, like you can't see beyond just us four and no more. In fact, here, here's how the message paraphrase handles this, 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 uh, this verse right here, Matthew 6. It says, your eyes are windows into your body. If you open your eyes wide and wonder and believe, your body fills up with light. But if you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. Does that conjure some imagery? If you pull the blinds on your windows, what a dark life you will have. And again, what Jesus is saying, guys, he's going back. Remember, he's going back to storing up treasures on earth or treasures in heaven, connecting it to our eyes. What he's saying is that when we live just for the things of earth, it's like digging and digging. And eventually, we start getting so deep that all we can see is earth. All we want is earth. All we lust for is earth. All we're trying to get is more earth. Right, And what happens is you don't, you don't find yourself saying it, but you find yourself thinking like, man, this thing is about me and about mine and about my bank account and what I can get. And I want to buy three more of these and two more of those and another one of these, and new one of these guys. Because all you can see is earth. You can't see anybody outside of your hole. You can't see anybody outside of your circle. Come on, it's just it's us four and no more. You know, us three, including me. Us five just trying to stay alive. How many of y'all are in your family? I don't know. But that's it. That's all you can see is just like what's right here. Me, my bank accounts, my stuff, mine. It's my money and I want it now. Like it's mine. And that's what living with a bad eye is. It's just dark. It's dark. All you can see is just your stuff and I got to do this and I want to take another vacation over here. And what you find out at the end of the day is I haven't stored up anything there. It's all here. 
It's all here. And in fact, I've just spent it. I don't even, I don't even have it. Like, it's just out there. It's gone. All right, because I've just lived in this self-centered pit with a bad eye my whole life. John Piper says it like this. The blind eye cannot see the beauty of grace. It cannot see the brightness of generosity. It cannot see unexpected blessing to others as a precious treasure. It is an eye that is blind to what is truly beautiful and bright and precious and godlike. And guys, if we're really honest, a lot of us, even in church, still have bad eyes. Because most church, this is church culture. Listen, I'm not pointing fingers at, at anybody. Every single one of us has prayed to this. Church culture and church sermons have raised us on self-help, self-care, self-esteem, my treasure, my anointing, my calling, my hundredfold return, Come on, it's about me, me, me. You're blessed life, you're blessed life, you're blessed life, you're blessed life. Everybody gets a blessed life. Look underneath your seat. You get a blessed life. <laughs> and what it does, it causes us to just turn inward. And you're like, I, I should be blessed. And we turn a, a dark, blind eye to the needs in the world around us. And guys, here's the reality. A lot of us are at this place where we know how to make it, but we don't know how to give it. We know how to make it, but we don't know how to give it. And so what happens is we dam up the blessing in our life, and we just got it all right here, but nothing's getting through us. And I believe this, guys. If God can get it through you, he'll get it to you, right? So some of us, we need to start praying, God, I know how to make it, but teach me how to give it. God, would you teach me? How to? Now others of you are like, hey, I don't really have that problem. Can I pray, God, teach me how to make it? Because I'd like a little bit more, right? No, here, here's the deal. Here, I, I believe this. Yes, I think you can pray that prayer, but I believe this, guys. I think sometimes God's like, why would I give you more so you can be faithless with more? Can you be faithful with a little bit that you have? And if you can be faithful with little, I'll give you more. And if I can get it through you, I'll get it to you. And a lot of us say, hey, I'll be generous when I have more. No, you won't. If you cannot be generous with little, you will not be generous with much. Can you learn how to be generous when you just have a handful of breadcrumbs? Can you do it when you have little because you're showing, I trust God to continue bringing into my life? Come on, guys. This, this, is, um, this is why Andrew Murray, I love this man. He said, the world asks, what does a man own? Christ asks, how does he use it? How does he use what he has? How do we use what we have? And I'm here today, guys, to tell you that God wants to rescue us from a poverty mentality. A poverty mentality, listen, does not depend on how much you have. You can have a ton of money and still have a poverty mentality because what you're saying is I'm my provider. There's a limited amount of supplies in this world and if it's gonna be, it's up to me, right? God wants to rescue us from a poverty mentality that would cause us to close off that would cause us to blind our eyes to what everybody else is going through and we store up and we store up and we store up because the Antichrist is coming back at any moment. Come on, like the, the Trump's gonna come in, the wheels are gonna fall off. I got a store up. I got to call 1 800 into the world and get my kits, fill up my basement, protect it with my shotguns. Right? And we store up and we store up and we store up. We hoard up, we hoard up, we hoard up. And it ends up that all of our treasures are here. And we've got enough. We store up to the point where we've got enough for five years. Meanwhile, our neighbor is cutting their piece of chicken in thirds so their kids can eat. And that's what a blind eye does. But when we shift from earth to heaven, from greed to God, from selfishness to generosity, what happens is God empowers us to get up out of that self-centered pit that we've been in. And now we start seeing the air is clear. I can see differently. I can think differently. The sun is shining. Look at all these opportunities out here. There's so much more going on in this world than just us four and no more. When God starts lifting my eyes, in fact, I love this, Proverbs um, eleven twenty four. 24, the message paraphrase, says the world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed, and those who help others are helped themselves. How many of you ex have experienced this in your life? 
Come on, somebody. I, that the world of the generous gets larger and larger and larger. The world of the stingy, the bad eye gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Listen, when, when Summer and I got married, I was blind. I had bad eyes. But, but three things changed me. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and Summer. And sometimes I confuse the Holy Spirit and Summer. <laughs> because she, she's so generous. Like, she has such good eyes. Like, her eye, that started rubbing off on me. Like, I, I, listen, I would see people in need and be like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, buddy. And they're like, I ain't got no boots. How am I supposed to pull myself up? I'd be like, you, you got yourself in that situation. You deserve that. God's cursing you. That'd be like the, the disciples. Remember when they found the blind guy? And they're like, hey, Jesus, who the sin, this guy or his parents? And Jesus is like, hey, guys, uh, he's blind. He's not deaf. He can hear you. Um, <laughs> but let's not be so critical on the, like, are we always looking for reasons not to give? Or are we looking for reasons to give? And the more I hung around her, something started happening in my life. And now, listen, guys, we've given, we've given away money. We've given away cars. Like, the amount of giving we're able to do today, there's extra zeros on the end of it from where we were early on. Because I believe this. If God can get it through you, he'll get it to you. And the word of the generous gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it is more blessed to give than to receive. Everything gets better when your life turns generous. Everything gets bigger, bigger and better when your eyes get brighter and better. And our posture, because I know some of you are like, I don't have very much, but listen, our posture should be, God, you have not been stingy with me, so I will not be stingy with others. You may not be um, wealthy compared, I'm not gonna say compared to the rest of the world because every single one of you is wealthy compared to the rest of the world, right? If you've been to the rest of the world, you know what I'm talking about. You may not be as wealthy as your neighbor, but you still have something to be able to share with somebody in need. And that's what happens when you get good eyes. And so I'm gonna ask you a question. This, I think this is a really good self-examination question. If you could change somebody's life by how you live and by how you give, would you do it? Yeah. Careful with your answer. Because you're in church, God listening. <laughs> and he's gonna give you an opportunity at some point to be able to do that. But for us to do that, we're gonna have to have good eyes. Everybody say good eyes. Good eyes. Good eyes. See, here's what Jesus is telling us. Don't store up in, uh, on earth, store up in heaven. What he's telling us is when we set the true treasure, the true telos, when we set the true treasure of our life in heaven and we begin to store up our treasures there instead of here, your whole life begins to open up. Like, now I can think more clearly. Now I see things differently because here's what's happening. I'm actually starting to realize, not just think of it conceptually, I'm actually starting to realize that this is not my home. There is my home. Right? Hebrews 11 talks about that a lot, that the heroes of the faith, they live different because they were living for another world. And listen, if you went on vacation somewhere, would you buy a house there and a bunch of stuff and store up really big there knowing you were going to go home? Listen, we're going home. So we're invited to view everything here a little bit differently. I'm not saying you can't buy stuff, but put it through a different lens. That's what good eyes do. Because now... I actually realized if there's my home, I wanna use my money to help people get there. I'm not saying you can't buy somebody into heaven, but I can advance the gospel. I can be a blessing to the world around me, right? I can use my money to bless others, not just bless myself. And when I do that, guys, my whole life begins to get bright. My life changes from black and white to color. I've experienced this. No longer am I shutting my eyes to the needs of others. No longer is it just about us four and no more, or my three, including me. No longer am I living suspicious of those who have more and refusing to give to those who have less. Like the message paraphrase says, no longer am I living with the blinds of my life closed. You, ever, you, you know, you have neighbors you ever pull into your house and you see the blinds go right, on your neighbor, they're like, oh, what's going on out there? That's how a lot of us live. Like, mm, I don't know. And every once in a while, we'll slip a few dollar bills like through the crack to like, ease our conscience a little bit about what's happening in the world. But guys, here's what happens when I get good eyes, the blinds of my life open, <laughs> the front door of my life swings wide because of Jesus, I once was blind but now I can see. 
And what good eyes do, it helps me to see the needs in the world around me in a way that I never have before. Well, one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible is found in Acts 3. And it's one of my favorite stories for, for a number of reasons. But um, this comes right after uh, Acts 1, where Jesus raises uh, or ascends into heaven. This comes at, right after Acts 2, where the Holy Spirit comes down on Pentecost. Now the disciples, the people of God, are actually entering into the regular rhythm of their life. And we find them here in Acts 3. Here's what it says. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day, everybody say every day, day. to beg from those going into the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked, everybody say looked. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from him. And then Peter said very famously, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Love it. Okay. Now, I love this story for two big reasons. One, Peter had some crazy faith that day. All right, I don't know the last time you grabbed a dude sitting in a wheelchair and yanked him out. That could have gone really bad, really quick. All right, but Peter did it anyways, like he stepped out in faith. But here's the other reason why I love this story for today. Here's what it says. This guy had been crippled from birth. He couldn't walk. And especially in that society, there's no hope for you. There's no future for you. So people, maybe family, maybe friends, bring him every single day. They carry him every single day, and they set him down in the temple, like right outside in the temple courts. They set him down so he can beg. This is how he eats. This is how he just ekes along in his life based on the generosity, maybe the pity, the mercy of other people. He's here every single day, not most Mondays, not every third Thursday. He is here every single day. Now, here's the deal. We read right before this, Acts 3, we read in Acts 2 that the lifestyle that the disciples entered into was that every day the disciples continued to meet together in the temple courts. That means Peter and John are here every day. This man was here every day. They are all here Every day. Here's the question. How many times had Peter and John walked right past this guy? Let's put it in its context. Let's put it in its real context. How many times had Peter and John walked right past this guy on their way to church? How many times had Peter and John walked to the other side of the street as they left church because they had to beat the Baptist to lunch? (laughs) How many times had Peter and John been leaving a ball game and they heard somebody asking for money and they refused to look over there and so they just kind of raised their voices and pretended like they didn't hear him? Could it be that in the midst of endeavoring to live a life for Jesus, we walk right past the people he's called us to love? But this day, something was different. Because this day, Peter did something that he had never done before. What did he do? Come on, what did he do? It's not rhetorical. He looked at the man. I'm not saying he saw him because Peter had seen him every day. And there's a difference in passively seeing, being aware of something and pausing your life and turning and looking and engaging it. And most of us don't wanna do that. You wanna know why? Here's how I'd say it. Most of the time, we don't wanna look. 
Because if we look, then we got to do something about it. Because listen, if I, yeah, I'm aware, I'm aware of that thing. No, no, no. Have you looked at it? Have you looked at the faces? Have you looked into the eyes of it? Because here, here's why we don't do it. Here's why we don't do it, okay? Because if I turn and look at the person who's asking for money or whatever situation, okay, if I actually turn and look in their eyes, then I might actually come to realize that they're made in the image of God too. And if I look at them, I'm in danger of loving them. And if I love them, I have to do something about it. So it requires something of us. So most of us would rather be blind. Turn, look the other way. No, no, no. But this is what a good eye does, guys. A good eye acknowledges that everything I have comes from God. Not just 10%, 100%. And I'm just simply a steward. A good eye goes the extra mile. A good eye gives until it hurts. A good eye pauses and looks. And I guarantee you guys, a good eye knows that it is more blessed to give than to receive. And maybe you're starting to pick up that it's not always naturally fun to have good eyes. Because if I have good eyes, that means I see the poor. That means I see the prisoner. That means I see the war. I see a famine. I see the needy. I see the naked. I see the weak. I see the widow. I see the orphan. I see the outcast. I see the disabled. I see the disadvantaged. I see the refugee. I see the immigrant. I see the injustice. I see it. I can't turn a blind eye to it. And because God has opened my eyes now, I see it. And when I see it, I have to look at it. And when I look at it, I have to love it. And when I love it, I have to do something about it. And family, we have a decision to make. How will we walk? With bad eyes, closed off to the needs of other people, or with good eyes? Looking around, acknowledging that we have been blessed to be a blessing. And victory, here's what I know. We can be those people. Here's, here's actually what I already know. We already are those people. But God's calling us to a new level. God's calling us to a new level of having good eyes. In fact, I, I, let, me, let me just say it like this. Um, my, I think my favorite meeting here at Victory, I know some of you are like, you work at a church, all your meetings are your favorite meetings. <laughs> Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> like all of us, we have certain things we enjoy and certain things not so much. Um, so my favorite meeting here at Victory, um, we don't have a better thing to call it. We call it our 20% meeting. We call it our 20% meeting where forever ago we made the commitment before the Lord um, to the best of our ability and we've always done it. We are gonna give at least 20% of what comes in back out the local global missions, gospel, whatever it looks like to go out. And we just call it our 20% meeting. And so we sit down pretty frequently, maybe once a quarter, a little bit more, and we look at how much has come in, and we say, all right, this is how much has to go out. And it has, you know, we do our monthly mission support and all those sorts of things, but um, we actually have X amount to do some projects or to do this, and I love this, guys. In April, we had one of my favorite, of the favorite meetings of the 20%. In April, we sat down at that meeting just a few months ago, and in one meeting, we gave away $370,000. You guys did that. Like, that's what we did. We gave away 300. Now, some of you are like, okay, how do I get, how do I get some of that? Okay, there's a process, there's a missions project. We, we, what we call it is our ROS, return on souls. Come on, we got some business people in here who can appreciate that. And uh, we, did, we did a number of projects uh, locally as well as globally, but here's just a few of them. I love this. You guys didn't even know you did this, but we did it together. Um, we completed a dormitory in Kenya for girls who had been rescued. You did that. You did that. There are other projects that we pick up that maybe aren't this big ROS, but they're things that are special to the heart of God, that we believe that. And so there's a ministry that we work with in Ecuador, and um, they, they do housing for adults with special needs. 
And if you're in a third world area and has special needs, it's not good. So they actually take these people in and have uh, housing for, uh, and ministry and care for adults with special needs. But they didn't have the money to run hot water, which is very expensive. They didn't have money to run hot water. And so we just decided, hey, I think we as a church can care about the dignity of adults with special needs in a third world area. And so we're gonna run the hot water so that they can take a bath. You did that. You did that. We held, in that meeting, we helped four young adults in Georgia get adopted into forever homes. So um, they aged out of foster care at 18 and now they're just, they're homeless, they're orphans. And so they get adopted into homes that specifically want to adopt 18 year old plus. Um, we reached out to uh, the home that we uh, got here in Atlanta a few Christmas gift to the worlds ago uh, for victims of sex trafficking, and we built another bedroom inside that home so another girl at a time can be brought in through there, rescued, redeemed, introduced to Christ, and propelled onto a different direction. Uh, we sponsored a summer camp here in Georgia just about a month ago to get kids off the street. We, uh, we sponsored a job program for homeless men downtown. You did it, you didn't even know you did it. Um, then in June, just a few months ago, together across all of our Victory campuses, we raised $316,000 for Layla's home. So down in South Florida, many of you gave to that. And that's, that's like in the works right now, that that home in South Florida, where there's tens of thousands of women being trafficked, there's actually a home that they're gonna be able to be brought through and rescued and brought off the streets and given a new lease on life. In that same message where we gave the call, I, I talked about one of my favorite projects that we've been able to do recently in June was we learned uh, through a pastor that we know in South Asia, we learned of a family who had been in multi-generational slavery, like literal slavery. And uh, we didn't, you didn't even know it, but for just a few thousand dollars, we were able to liberate a family, mom, dad, and five kids from multi-generational slavery and to bring them into a home and to give dad means to actually start his business business with dignity, with di where he's actually putting his hand to something. Well, just this last week, super cool, hot off the press, um, the pastor who we know in that same area told us about seven teenage street kids. Now, if you know about street kids in, in these really bad areas, they uh, have no families and they are homeless. As about 11, 12, 13 year old, we found seven street kids uh, who uh, had found a business owner and they said, hey, can we sleep in your business at night when you're not using it? And the guy said, sure, you can sleep there as long as you work for me during the day, which sounds okay, until the man's business started not thriving as much. And so he decided to start selling these seven boys out into homes to do whatever. And this pastor found out about it and said, hey, we have another, another opportunity for you. And so you didn't even know it, but we looked and we saw in this last week, we liberated seven teenagers and we got them into Christian homes in the process of being adopted, given a new lease on life. We got a picture up here. This just happened, like this week, this just happened. <laughs> then in December, as an entire church, we looked and we saw the plight of many men who have been incarcerated, that when they get uh, released from prison, about 70% of them end up back in prison because they don't know how to do life on the outside. So we partnered with a ministry called Tackle the Shackles uh, to fully engage men in that process. And again, give them a new lease on life. We looked, we saw this. And so across all the victory, across all of our campuses and our Christmas gift to the world, we gave the most we had ever given, $840,000 was given in Christmas gift to the world. And so half of that went global to Jason and Sarah, who are right here at this service, um, to Projects for Progress in Benin, West Africa, to uh, transform the community, to plant churches and see people get saved and really radically engage that community with the gospel. Half of it went global, the other half stayed local here with Tackle the Shackles. And so I have a really cool update that we have the home, that men are actively being ministered to there, even right now this morning, and we have a video update. Let's take a look. Tackle the Shackles is a ministry that helps men coming out of prison. There are over 10,000 men coming out every week in America. 70% of them go back, and they go back because they don't have that better second chance of housing. 
jobs, transportation, life coaching, and Tackle the Shackles is here to tackle those shackles. We're excited about being able to provide and serve these men to come back and reintegrate back into society. My name's Stacy McPhee. I was incarcerated six months prior to coming here, and my life was out of control. And when I got out, got in contact with Pastor Lee, and I wound up here. And when I came here, man, I knew this where God wanted me to be. I've been at the new Tackle the Shackle reentry home for about four months. It's, it's here to help a person get their life back together, you know? It's here to help a person get back in tune with Christ. It's so peaceful, you know, in the mornings you can get up and read you some scriptures and go sit out there on the back deck and, you know, just be at one, you know, with Christ and with God. God has blessed me since I've been here, you know, to obtain a, a very, very good job. I couldn't ask for nothing better. You know, it has truly been a blessing to me. So I take that every day and I give God his praises. Victory, your Christmas gift to the world allowed us to purchase this beautiful home to be able to house seven men at a time to help them reintegrate back into society. We were able to purchase a van to get the men back and forth to work, to probation office, to courts. And we have plans on this 2.2 acres of land to put a prefab home, and we're looking forward to be able to serve more men. Thank you, Victory, for partnering with Tackle the Shackles. See, guys, something powerful happens when you pause and you look. Don't turn a blind eye. You look and you engage it. And so today, we have another opportunity to have good eyes. So some of you may not know this, but here at Victory, uh, we have an absolute, I wanna say amazing, I wanna say incredible. We have an, an incredible special needs ministry and special circumstances ministry here at Victory. We do, it's absolutely, it's, it, I love it. God has blessed this thing. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the things we realized, one of the stories we started to hear was that on the other side of COVID, for some reason, I don't know why, I'm not gonna judge it, but for some reason on the other side of COVID, a lot of churches around Atlanta were shutting down their special needs ministries, which was odd to us because we didn't wanna shut down special needs. We actually wanted to take it to the next level. Right, And so um, every single weekend now, we minister to literally dozens and dozens and dozens of children, of youth during these services. There, there, there's even like a buddy system. I don't know if y'all knew that. There's a buddy system for kids on the spectrum, like for youth ministry and things like that. Like that we have buddy systems here in, in special rooms and sensory rooms and everything here at, at Victory. And we started hearing stories. So we started hearing stories like from one mom who said that she had gone to about five churches with, with uh, special needs ministries. But every single time she went, she was pulled out of service because her son needed her attention. And it got to the point where she was just getting weary, she was giving up hope, she was about to give up on God because she felt like God had given up on her. And then she came to victory. And that first week, she was able to sit through the entire service and she met with a good shepherd who led her by the still waters to restore her soul and gave her the strength and the joy to then go back over who, when she picked up her son, he said, I wanna come every single Sunday and then our pastor for special needs looked at her and said, welcome home. She broke down crying. And we heard from another mom who had been looking for a church for her son for five years. And then she found a home at Victory as well. I heard from another mom who had been watching services at home, like maybe some of you are today. Um, she had been watching services at home because she didn't even know that her home church had a special needs ministry for her son. And when she found out there was a special needs ministry here, specifically with a sensory room, um, she said, I'm gonna come. And when she brought her son, he found community and she got engaged in community as well, as all of us are able to do this morning. She was able to enter in because we had a ministry just for her family. We found another mom who was really struggling because she had a teenage daughter who had Down syndrome and really struggling to find friends, really struggling to find a school, and especially struggling to find a church. And so you can imagine how excited she was when she dropped off her daughter, and then when she picked up her daughter, how, how the joy in her daughter's face to show her the friendship bracelet that she had made in the ministry. 
And when the mom found out that there are other teenage girls here in Victory who have Down syndrome, and that her daughter was gonna have friends in the community, it was a game changer. So Victory, here today, we have an opportunity to pause and to look at a group of people that a lot of people don't pause and look at. Because for whatever reason, it might feel uncomfortable, I don't know how to engage that. No, listen, we're a church and we're a family who pauses and looks at the things that are special to God's heart, okay? And we have an opportunity now to reach more families than we ever have, all right? So if you're aware, if you've been here for a little while, um, we raised money a little while ago and we're right there, like we're about just a few weeks away from moving pretty much all of our children's ministry over to the wing over here. Okay, over here. Now, we, we, this is always our joke forever. It's like, hey, if you have a lot of kids in different ages, you put in about 17,000 steps before you even set foot inside the sanctuary here. So um, you guys provided a way for us to get all the children's ministry over there. And what it did, it freed up space over here, right? So now we're not only just gonna have one room for special needs, we're not gonna have two, we're not gonna have three, we're gonna have five rooms for special needs right over here. And we're gonna have two for younger kids, we're gonna have one for teenagers, we're gonna have a sensory room, and then we're gonna have one that we're gonna endeavor to do uh, um, special needs ministry for adults over there in that space. So here's the deal, when we did all the math, the, 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 the rough number it comes out to right at $150,000 to do that project over here. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna give to that today. I'm not gonna turn a blind eye, we're gonna give to this. Can we put the, the QR code uh, up here on the screen? So here's what I wanted you guys to do. Go through, connect to Victory, go to the giving page, um, however you get to the giving page. And you're gonna see a, a line there at the bottom that says fund. I want you to click fund and go to future builders. So it's the future builders fund. So ties, uh, that's our 10% offerings. It's just you know, goodwill offerings that we give. There's another line there for heart of the house. That's what goes out of Victory. Future builders are things that we're doing specifically and specially around here. And make sure you give to Norcross um, future Builders, because that's gonna go to what God is doing here at Norcross, Hamilton Mill, and all, all the other campuses. They're doing special projects as well. So here, here's what that, that rough cut of the, the, the math kind of equates out to. If there's five rooms, $150,000, about $30,000 a room. And I know God has blessed you know, all of us in, in varying different degrees. And I said this last service. I, I said this, I said, hey, this isn't like a put your hand on the TV moment. I, I just said, hey, I'm not saying that thus saith the Lord. I just know this by numbers. I said, there's somebody here or family here who's been looking for a way to be radically generous. And there's somebody here who God is now presenting this opportunity to, to sponsor a room. To say, hey, I, I'm gonna give $30,000 to this project. And really cool, somebody already did it. So one of those rooms is already sponsored. We got four more to go. And so if you, listen, if you're in that place financially, go for it. If you got five bucks, go for it. Because here's the deal. It, we can do more together than we ever could apart, ever good separate. And we've proven that over the decades of victory, that we can do some pretty radically amazing things when we don't turn blind eyes, but we actually have good eyes to what's happening in the world. And we got a really cool project that God has put on our heart to be able to bless something that blesses his heart. And we're gonna do this thing together, Victory. And so uh, let's endeavor to do that together. So I, I, with that in mind, I wanna ask you this one question, just one more time. If you could change somebody's life by how you live and by how you give, would you do it? Yes. We have an opportunity right here, but here's the deal. I wanna expand that out. As I've been talking over the last few minutes, some of you have been like, I know my neighbor needs help. Somebody's been like my family member or the, the, that family um, that goes to the, the school where my kid's at. Guys, God is giving us an opportunity today to leave our blind eyes behind. They're self-centered, that are all just about earth. And to actually have good eyes where we lift our eyes up full of color, not looking for reasons not to give, but seeing the wide swath of opportunities we have every single day to be a blessing to the world around us. Let's have good eyes. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, amen. Let's do this. Let's close our eyes. <laughs> Let's open up our hearts. God, I don't know how better to say it than this is that we do not want to live closed-fisted. We want to live open-handed. And in order for us to do that, 
God, we can't have blind eyes anymore. We need to have open eyes, good eyes. And I know this, good eyes are God's eyes. We want to see like God sees. But I also know this, the only way we can have God's eyes is if we're born again. And God comes to live on the inside of us. So here's what we're going to do, okay? I'm going to, I'm going to lead us in a prayer in just a second. Here, here's the idea. Some of us today, we just need to kind of confess that we've been living with blind, dark, self-centered eyes. And if we really understood God was looking at our, our bank statement, I don't, I don't know if we'd be really pleased about that. And so this is our opportunity to say, God, I want, I want Christ in my life. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna repent from that way of life and I wanna step into your way of life because you so love the world that you gave. And you gave your most, you gave your best, you gave your son. So God, may that life and that spirit and that DNA get on the inside of me. So if that's you today, I wanna invite you into prayer to, to turn from death into life, <laughs> from lifelessness into heaven forever. And it starts today. And family around these guys, I want you to pray with them. Let's pray like this. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me even when I was your enemy. Thank you, Jesus, for going to the cross, for dying for my sin. You bled so I could be free. And then you rose again, and you're alive right now. So right now, I repent of my sin, my greed, my selfishness, my bad blind eyes, and I turn to Jesus. Today, I confessed Christ as my Lord and Savior. I commit my life to you for the rest of my days. And right now, I am born again. I'm a new creature. God, give me your eyes to be a blessing as I've been blessed for the rest of my days until I see you face to face. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. come on, amen, amen. Come on, let's give glory to God. Amen.